everybody. Uh, personally, you know, I'm a frequent visitor of this country, always very happy to come back. This is a very beautiful country, a very beautiful city. And uh, coming here for the last, I would say, uh, more than 20 years, uh, I don't know if you recognize, but I see a lot of development and things happening here very quickly. I hope uh, Ukraine will be uh, doing very well in the future. Now, this is the 10th anniversary of uh, Lisod. Started as a dream about, I think, 12, 13 years ago when Dr. Mayberg approached me and then later Mr. Amzel approached me. I thought they were talking theory, but in no time the theory or dreams became a reality and I'm very glad to participate in this conference celebrating the 10th anniversary, 11th years of action. Our speakers today are, I would say, front line of Israeli basic science and oncology, number one. It is really an honor, Yossi, I'm from the bottom of my heart. I was so happy and I was so actually, um, I still remember the, when I watched on television the moment when you received the Israel Prize in uh, uh, Life Sciences for the year 2017, presented to Professor Yarden by the Prime Minister, I think, and the President of Israel in Jerusalem. This is a unique prize to, um, because Professor Yarden actually, uh, if you go to international meetings, you look at uh, lectures on Herceptin, Pertuzumab, you will always see the name Yarden, you'll see in the bottom of the size of everybody, quoting is basic science which led to our clinical ability to give these important treatments uh, for patients with cancer. So uh, really, we are very proud to have you in Israel and to have you here. Thank you so much. And you know, Professor Yarden is, I think, the second time that he's uh, giving us this honor to be with us. Then we have uh, excellent clinicians from Haifa, Dr. Avivit Peer from Rambam. You know, I'm very proud that these two ladies, uh, Dr. Peer and Dr. Mo Moskowitz, were both of them residents, trainees, and now are senior doctors in, our, in the department at Rambam, Technion faculty, which is very, you know, our Technion University in Haifa. Haifa is a small town, but very proud to have three Nobel laureates in a small city, you know, a city of 350,000 people with three Nobel laureates two of them from the medical school. So uh, I'm very proud of this medical school, the graduates of this medical school. Dr. Peer is in charge of the uh, clinical studies on new drugs at the um, oncology center there and in charge of urology cancer. And Dr. Moscovich is dealing with lung cancer after spending a period in Princess Margaret in Canada, in uh, Toronto. And of course, we have here the local speaker, Dr. Victoria. Kosinova, good morning, Victoria. She will talk about the aspect, very serious aspect. You know, we can sp speak about science and new developments, but who can afford all of these drugs? It is a very problematic problem, how you regulate it and how you make it able that everybody will receive these important treatments. So we're looking forward to your excellent talks today. Now, always use this slide. I think we are in the era of revolution and evolution. There were a few revolutions in cancer. Let mention like the nitrogen master, the revolution that came, brought the treatment of leukemia and then to solid tumors. The revolution of the new drugs in oncology. The revolution finding the radiation and improving it. And now we are in the era that gives us the results of mapping of the cancer genome. This is the path, actually, to precision medicine. Everybody remembers this uh, Time magazine issue from 2001, when there was a big hope that we now we'll have some pills that we'll give to the cancer patients, and no more surgery, no more nothing. we just just a matter of time to solve the issue. But we know now that each time know that we need more and more to do to improve, but we are doing it in the right way. And the changing concepts in cancer management, 
moving from the maximal tolerable treatment where you give a very toxic treatment to everybody to be able to give minimal effective treatment and just hit the target without harming the normal tissues. This is a nice example, a patient that had before mastectomy and radiation for breast cancer and later she had another breast cancer but she was treated in more modern time so her breast is preserved and you hardly can see the changes of radiation. So just look at that, moving from maximal tolerable to minimal effective in surgery, radiation, etc. Look at the rapid development of drugs, but the latest top topics in clinical oncology are the genetic profiling, the targeted agents, and the immunotherapy, leading to precision cancer therapy and to personalized medicine. The NIPS, for instance, the, one of the first drugs for uh, uh, the imatinib, for GIST, doing miracles, look at the PET scan before and after treatment. I was witnessing this miracle. We had a patient in Haifa that was about to die, like the last few days of his life, and we gave him a few pills of this imatinib, and the patient survived for two and a half years later. He came, I mean, stood on somebody who was about to die. Disease just disappeared. This was just a miracle at that time. Look at the Vismo de Gib on the hedgehog pathway, before treatment, after treatment with pill. So the other thing that we're doing is the molecular profiling of tumors to look for actionable mutations. We do now also not only tissue biopsy, but liquid biopsy, because we need to deal with the certain mutations that develop as the tumor is growing and receiving treatments, changing of the mutation to allow you to give them the special molecule to hit the special target identify targets for novel drugs, and just a few examples, but this will be dealt later. For instance, the vemorafenib with the BRAF mutated melanoma, before and after, PET scan before, after, everything disappears. And it's a matter of hours, this kind of miracle. You, you see a patient with full metastasis from melanoma, you give him the morafenib, next day he comes to you free of disease. Unfortunately, there is later resistance, but just look at the concept. Jefitinib in, in lung cancer. Actually, personally, we gave jefitinib before we knew even that the clinical application of EGFR. We gave it to a few patients with adenocarcinoma, and we had a beginner's luck. Disease disappeared, and patients that were about to die lived a few years. This is happening in front of our eyes, or doing a liquid biopsy revealing this T7900, 790M mutation, which allows you to give a targeted drug and acquire another uh, remission by Dr. Moore Moskowitz will speak about that. And of course the MABs, the antibodies, for instance, the epilumab and melanoma, everybody knows and I, I hope it will be like a routine even here in, in, here in Ukraine. Of course it's a routine recommendation for patients with melanoma coming to uh, this sort to be treated by these immunotherapies. Changing concepts in cancer management, we move from cancer eradication to cancer, what we call containment. Turning cancer from apparent death sentence into manageable chronic disease. And we see now patients with the targeted therapies and immunotherapies that survive for years. The only problem is that not everybody who are very, very enthusiastic, but we are enthusiastic with a few cases, but it's better than nothing. Not everybody responds, but those that respond, we see something that we never saw before patients living for months and years. And of course, there are also side effects to the uh, targeted therapies, like here, what I show you here, but I think the most problem is the financial toxicity. It's a new term in oncology, financial toxicity. Well, you give uh, Kitruda to somebody with uh, lung cancer or with melanoma, every two, three weeks, 10 to $15,000. Who can afford this price? Not many, very, very few. Which countries can afford it? What can we do about it? It's an international problem, you know? It's an international problem. We need a revolution in that because uh, it is very nice to discuss it in conferences, but we need it for the patients and nobody can afford it. So we have to think carefully in each country and worldwide, how can we make it that everybody can, that needs the drug will receive it. Just this treat meeting will not deal with radiotherapy, but I need to say a few words because radiotherapy still, despite of all these developments in immunotherapy, targeted therapy, surgery, 
and radiotherapy will stay forever. Believe me, they will be more important. They will be more precise, more personalized, but they will stay forever. So surgeons and radiation oncologists keep on going. Don't change your profession. It will have another pattern, but it will stay because it's important. Just one word. We always thought about radiotherapy in terms of dose escalation, killing more cells, etc., etc., and we have piles of books with radiobiology to explain. But what we learned recently is that radiotherapy has the potential to convert the irradiated cell into an in situ vaccine that elicits tumor specific T cells. And this is demonstrated here, for instance, by the work of uh, um, Dr. Formenti. She's now in New York. Uh, treating a tumor in the mediastinum and looking at a metastasis in the lung that was not irradiated but regressed because the immune, immunological effect of the local radiotherapy. Just briefly, this is a case treated in Haifa. At that time, we didn't know about the abscopal effect. We irradiate a low dose to the spleen for somebody with CLL, and we watched a lesion in the lip disappearing after one day. Now we know it's a scopal effect. At that time, we didn't know. We just described it as a phenomenon. So radiotherapy now is very precise. We use all these uh, high-dose rate, uh, all those uh, external beam radiotherapy, 3D planning, IMRT, IGRT, helical radiotherapy, and recently the stereotactic body radiotherapy. All of them have, number one, technological advancement, but also a radiobiology, different way of radiobiology thinking. This is not the stage to tell it, and, but we try to apply all of these innovations also in LISOD. Uh, giving radiation to a moving target, give, being so precise that you really can hit the target and not harm the normal tissue, allows you to be, to give the stereotactic treatment, which means very high doses, few fractions, and treat even single metastases and oligometastases with a curative intent. Why? Because the technology allows you to hit the target and not hit around it. And these high doses of radiation produce, again, miracles. Stereotactic radiotherapy for brain, primary lesions, metastases, you can just kill them with one dose of radiation. You treat a lung lesion with stereotactic radiotherapy and you achieve local control of 80 to 90 percent, easily competing with surgery. So the surgeons need to think twice before operating on a single lesion. Maybe with a few doses, three, five doses of radiation, you can just eliminate the disease. So it's a new way to think, treating stereotactically brain, multiple brain lesions. Another, just to the end, teragnosis, using nuclear medicine not only as a diagnostic but as a therapeutic modality. For instance, the 177 lutetium labeled PSMA for prostate cancer. Here you see a patient with full with more metastasis due to prostate cancer, treated with the PSMA but connected to lutetium, lutetium I'm sorry, 177, producing remission in the metastasis. This is a new way to treat prostate cancer with radiation. So, to summarize. We are in an era of molecular biology and genomics, delivery of personalized targeted treatment and immunotherapy tailored to each individual patient's clinical and genetic profile, prediction of response and complication using cancers and normal tissues molecular signature, and finally, radiotherapy combined with smart molecules immunotherapy. These are the new innovations, and LISOD joins the, com the, 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 the group to implement those techniques in Lissod uh, Oncology Hospital. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you for having us. And happy 10th anniversary to Lissod.